you know, I was saying that I worked on Capitol Hill and I represented or I worked for the representative who had the world's largest landfill in the, I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. 26,000 tons of municipal solid waste every day. And I came to learn more about garbage than any human should. <laughs> and it, my colleagues, we had colleagues that worked with us in the mayor's office, the governor's office, and other people. And we all would joke about the useless knowledge we have about garbage. I mean, it was, it, it was ridiculous, right? But it was very, it was a critical, it was a critical issue because our district, you know, was taking all of New York solid waste, all of the, you know, eight and a half million people was going to one place. And so we desperately, well, the people desperately wanted that to change. This podcast is about real estate with intelligence. It is pulling the sword from the stone. This podcast is about that unique balance in real estate, that balance between technological intelligence and our emotional intelligence and the transactions and interactions with one another in the real estate process. That's why we're inviting expert guests, people who are knowledgeable and bring different perspective. Join me in exploring this fascination, the look behind the scenes of technological advancement and how it's interacting with people's decisions in real estate. Eugene, welcome to our podcast today, Real Estate with Intelligence. Great to have you on the show. You are a successful realtor with Remax Distinctive, and yet you've gone through a transition and career change into real estate. Uh, tell us more about your background and what, what brought you into real estate from that background. Yeah, well, thank you for having me today, Tommy. I've seen this broadcast before, and I've loved it. I've enjoyed your conversation, so I'm honored to be here. So I started... Um, on Capitol Hill. I came down here after law school, started working on Capitol Hill, spent a lot of time there, and then became a lobbyist and got into PR and public affairs and did that for over 20 years, I guess. Um, and then I returned to Capitol Hill for a few years as well. And I ended up becoming an executive recruiter for three years, which I really enjoyed. Um, and then the pandemic hit and things shifted in the industry, for me at least. And I decided to get into real estate because it's something I had talked about and thought about for years. And finally, I was motivated to do it and took, took the licensing exam here in Virginia and Maryland and became a real estate agent. And it's one of the interesting things. My, my, one of my first impressions and interactions with you is what a great dot connector this guy is. What a great networker this guy is. And, you know, seeing you in action and connecting all these dots and all these things that, you know, I was picturing, man, like this guy must have some kind of a, a political networking career. And sure enough, like that, you know, that, that is part of your background. Yeah. So describe, you know, that skill set of being able to just connect the dots and networking and why that um, was helpful for you to bring that skill set from um, the political background yeah. into real estate and how it's helped you in real estate. You know, it's it's virtually the same in, in a lot of ways. I'll, Bear with me on the analogy here, but if you look at why people vote for who they vote for and put aside whether they support somebody on a particular set of issues, they ultimately want to like the person they're supporting. They want to connect somehow, right? They want to feel as if the person for whom they're pulling the lever or pushing the button is aligned with them somehow. So they have to resonate with the person. And again, it, I'm politically agnostic on this, but I'm just saying whoever you're voting for will have connected with you somehow. And that's the person that gets elected more than anything else. You know, nobody reads through position papers that are 200 pages long. Nobody <laughs> looks at those things. They'll watch ads that are on television or that come up on social media. And it's the same in real estate because you and I virtually have the same access to all the technology out there, right? We can identify, we can do, um, comps in the certain areas. Uh, we have the access to the same houses and, and all that sort of information. So what makes you a better real estate agent than me? Well, maybe it's your ability to engage and connect with people. It's, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It's why should I trust Tommy with helping me buy or sell my property? 
I, you know, it's just really interesting already. Like, what a fascinating lead into really what I consider the main question of this podcast, which is technological advancement, artificial intelligence versus emotional intelligence or or the other forms of intelligence and and what's most important for this job. And what you just described is, hey, that this skill set of being able to relate, right. connect. You know, really technology matters, but it puts us all on an equal playing field. It does. And what what's the differentiator? You know, you just described as, hey, like you know, what what really can make a big difference in real estate and, and sales, what's made you successful is the ability to relate and connect the dots on an emotional intelligence That's level right. with others. So, you know, I'm also fascinated by this this transition from from politics to real estate. And also, you know, we both read a lot about the real estate issues that are being discussed in the polit- political world. Right. Um, and there's quite a few of them. I mean, there's yeah. affordable housing has been a hot topic for Absolutely. a long time. It's a topic that you know I'm pretty passionate about because I, I have certain viewpoints from an economics 101 area. But you know, tell me about some of the hot topics that interest you the most in real estate that are that are being talked about in, in the political arena right now. Yeah. So. I think one of them, well, one of them you and I have kind of discussed <laughs> on LinkedIn a little bit is working from home. Um, and there is a connection. There is a political connection. And you can see it right here in D.C. So, for example, during the pandemic, so many people, you know, went to work from home, stayed in their houses and didn't go downtown to Washington, D.C. to work. Now, that has a cascading effect on all those small businesses that rely on people coming to work every day, getting their coffee, getting their breakfast, getting lunch dinners, cocktails, and so on. And it's a huge ripple effect. And it wasn't just Washington, D.C. It was New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, LA. Every major city felt this too. But it's interesting here a bit in Washington, D.C., because what's happening here, um, and it probably in other places, but I would certainly say here in D.C., is that a lot of people became very accustomed to working from home, wherever that home was. It could have been in D.C., but it could also be, um, you know, in remote Maryland or Virginia for that matter. And what happened was people decided they didn't like to commute. They didn't want to spend over an hour in the car each way. And that's not some made up number, by the way. I mean, there's plenty of studies to back that up. But I live nine miles from where I worked in D.C. And it would take me a solid 45 minutes to get into work every day, often more. And about the same going home. So I know firsthand that's a very real number. And so what are the implications politically? Well, people decided, geez, I'm as efficient here as I am anywhere. Why can't I just work from home? And the problem became for these buildings. They didn't need as many people working. They didn't need as many people maintaining the buildings. So what did they do? They probably, they had to let a lot of these people go. So, you know, the service employees unions were right, rightfully concerned about their employees. I mean, this this is what they do. They maintain these buildings and have for many years. And on the other side of it, there were a lot of government employees unions who didn't want their employees going in because they made the argument, rightfully so, they don't need to be in the office. They've been working like this for two years. Why should they come back in? What's the argument for making these people come back in? So it left a lot of folks kind of in a difficult position. Because neither were wrong, right? right? Neither neither were, were particularly wrong, but each of them, you know, had an impact on what was happening in downtown D.C. And I'm sure in other areas, too. You know, there's there's so many interesting avenues on this, you know, the, the juxtaposition of, you know, being in politics and then transitioning to a real estate career and understanding that the difference between, OK, you know, I was commuting into D.C. Right. for my job. And the time it took and the commute. And now I'm recognizing that other people would rather stay at home right. than go through similar commutes. And that, that a journey you just took us through of, of the thought processes. And but your what the outlet was for you was, hey, I, I'll help people buy homes instead yeah. of commute to work. Yeah. So um, you are actually part of that ripple effect of the work from home thing, sure. you know, in a way, uh, you know, that or that's one of the outcomes of. You know, you you shifting with the pandemic as well. That's true. Um, and you know, th- we don't really know the full effect of these rip- the ripple effect, as you said, of the pandemic yet. And one of the interesting things I thought of before the pandemic 
was actually with all this self-autonomous driving concepts, you know, like, yeah. you know, oh, well, you know, if someday maybe we'll have cars that will drive us for us. And I know they've, 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 we've been getting closer and closer that, that there's a leap there that we, leap of faith there that we all have to make if we yeah. decide to go there as a society. But I thought, wow, wow, commutes won't matter anymore if we have self-autonomous. That's you know, right. I can sleep in the car <laughs> yeah, on right. the way to work. That's and, right. That's and, right. you know, this would be, um, but it would, it, the outcome is the same. So the, it's almost like, yes, the the pandemic in uh, fast forwarded mm-hmm. some of those concepts, but the more autonomous, the more efficient we want to be with our, our lives, the less likely we are to make that, that leap to long commutes unless it's easier for us to do that that's right or we're just not going to do it at all and try to work virtually from home so what are some of the other hot topics in the political arena in in real estate i mean um i think you talked about you're from new york yeah and you've seen some interesting things there with Brownfields to Brightfields, mm-hmm. and you know, tell us a little bit about some of those other things you've seen. So, an, another interesting, I don't know, challenge, and certainly a consequence of COVID, was the impact it's had on infrastructure. Now, last year, maybe a little more than that, uh, we agreed finally, Congress and the administration agreed on a huge infrastructure package, the largest infrastructure package ever, which was good. It was a very good thing because we certainly had a lot of decaying infrastructure, bridges, rails, all over the place. So that everybody agreed, you know, on a bipartisan basis that this was a good thing for the country. But what's happened is, and something that the government couldn't control, at least the federal government, even the state and local governments couldn't control, was the impact it had on mass transit. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the New York City MTA, which runs all the buses and trains and subways, uh, and actually the commuter rails as well, and some of the bridges in New York as well, is facing a $500 million shortfall in its budget. DC, WMATA, is facing a similar short shortfall mm. as well. Lack of users yeah, through the tolls and paying the train fees, et cetera. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right, because the trains are still running, and the infrastructure still is decaying, Right, because that's that's a fixed cost. So that's, those capital costs don't go away, and the improvements that need to be made don't go away. You still need to make them over time, and you just don't have as many people getting on mass transit or commuter rails. Um, so what happens? You're gonna have to raise fares, which they did in New York. They didn't raise them as much as people had anticipated. I guess that's that's a good thing, but they still got raised for a lot of people. And DC is having a similar challenge. Right as as to what to do now, uh, the new general manager Randy Clark is pretty dedicated to making it the you know the premier commuting system in the world, but he's facing some challenges now. I mean, he came in at a pretty difficult time. I think he's doing the best with the with the cards he's been dealt. But I think this is another one of those consequences hmm. that work from home or remote working has had, and it's not clear how they how you know, urban areas are going to get out of this. Yeah. You know, in in some of our previous correspondence, and I've seen some of the other articles you've posted on LinkedIn and your, your thought leadership and on the topic with work from home is it, well, okay. Yes. There's been um, a negative impact on the businesses and janitorial services, everything at these large office spaces where people are not going anymore. Um, Yet, has there been this this uh, equal and opposite reaction in the universe? Has there been a, a positive impact on the suburban communities or the residential communities where uh, people are staying at home more instead of tr- going into the office, or you know, they're not using the trains? But you know, where is the, where is the equal and opposite positive reaction from that that negative impact of not going into the office? You set me up very well for that. So thank <laughs> you. No, it's true. It, there there is right. So what does that mean? I, I think it means for suburban areas or people who have longer commutes or real estate agents is that it's forcing home prices up because people are willing to move a little further out, right? And get a little more land and also help con- contractors as well. Helps contractors because people want more space. They want to spend more money on fixing up a place they're going to spend a lot more time in for their kids and their friends and family. 
Um, so it's it's changing the face of suburban communities or even exurban communities where people move moving further and further away from urban areas because they're spending more and more time in these non-urban areas, right? So it's that's, I guess, the good news, right? Now, I guess to, to go back and contradict just a little bit of that good news is what's happening um, is that there's a premium on real estate and at least in the DMV here, there has been a lack of inventory. I mean, it's the biggest problem that that every real estate agent faces when somebody's looking to find a new home. It's lack of inventory. Mm. Now you can always find a home, but it's you know there's degrees of finding a home, right? Is it you know you're never going to find every. I told clients this the other day. You're never going to find one that ch- checks every box. If you have ten boxes, you know eight would be really good, nine would be great, but finding all ten is highly unlikely. Mm. But it's become more and more challenging simply because there isn't enough inventory yeah and uh you know from my perspective likely to be less than typical in a high high interest rate environment yeah that's the other problem is right? where now we have these homeowners that say wow you know i've got a three percent interest rate why would i sell my house to go to another home only to buy my next house at a six or a seven percent interest rate um, when i can just hang on to the one i have at half the rate yeah, first-time home buyers right now are having a bit of a, a bit of difficulty in the area yeah. because the prices are the prices, in fact, have not only not gone down; they've gone up. Mm-hmm. Now they haven't gone up as much as they had in the prior years during the pandemic, but they've still increased, right? So they're facing an uphill battle that way. Plus, as you point out, uh, interest rates continue to go up. Now, will they flatten? Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, will it be tomorrow? No. It would be an interesting psychological experiment, like on a on a massive scale or macro scale to see, you know, you, you mentioned, Hey, you know, you could have t- a list of 10 wants or 10 boxes to check if right. I'm trying to buy a house. Right. And in these 10 boxes I'm checking in my price range, um, there's just a lack of inventory. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if inventory were to triple, if they mm. would still be able to check all the boxes in their, on their list in their price range. Uh, my experience in real estate says, hey, if you're qualified up to $800,000 home purchase, everybody says, oh, I just, I only, I wish I could get the stuff that the $900,000 houses have <laughs> right. at 800,000 right. and I'd be so happy. Yeah, right. And then the people that are qualified for 900,000 are like, oh, you know, I just got a couple of boxes I'd love to check, but right. you know, those boxes I have to be able to qualify for 1.1 million instead of <laughs> 900,000. Right. And, you know, so goes the human desire and, and wish list. And, you know, it's almost as if everybody is always looking for something above their price point, or they always want something more than what is available to them. They can't, yeah. they, we want what we can't have, I guess is another way to look at it. Um, but I, I'm wondering is if we tripled the inventory, would it really solve the problem or would everybody still say, I'm just a little bit unsatisfied, but I'll, I'll check the eight out of the 10 boxes and I'll call it a day, right? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, th- probably not. Probably not. I mean, I suspect not. And I'll draw my experience as an executive recruiter. You know, uh, a f- company will give you a, a job description. And say, okay, we want to find a person to be senior vice president of whatever role. And here are the qualifications. Here's what we want. And you say, that's great. That all makes sense to me. Number of experience, education, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. And I've had the conversation on more than one occasion saying, this person, you know, she checks nine of the boxes. Yeah, we'd really like it to have three more years experience. Okay, we have somebody. Oh, well, he doesn't have, and and that becomes, you know, the ultimate tennis match with, because no, it it seems to me nobody has everything, and no piece of property has everything either, you know. So what I've said to clients in the past is, what are your priorities? I'll give them a number. I like to give them three. That seems like a good number. Um, cause if you give them too many, then all of a sudden everything's a priority, right? right, right. <laughs> so, you know, three seems like a good number. And then, cause you know, it's going to end up being five is the way I look at it. And they'll say, well, you know, if maybe if it's a new couple looking to start a family, they'll start with schools, you know, do, does it have a big enough backyard? Cause we want to have our kids play in the backyard. 
those seem like reasonable requests, right? And certainly enough bedrooms for a family and maybe entertaining space. All those seem enough. And you can work within those parameters, I think. You know, we can certainly recommend school districts, particular school districts to any, any of our potential clients. But that's something they can look at on their own. But in terms of the property itself, we can give them, you know, we can, back to your point earlier, Tommy, about, um, you know, real estate with intelligence and artificial intelligence and technological intelligence, we're able to do that pretty easily. You know, you want a four bedroom, three and a half bathroom house in whatever city, we can find that for you. Right. Will you like it? I don't know. You may not. <laughs> right. You may not like it. It may yeah. not be that. But we, sometimes we can check the boxes and it still doesn't feel right until you actually see it with your own eyes or see it and feel the community and et cetera. You know, I, I also over the years, it seems like, well, you know, I can get everything I want if I if I'll go five miles further away from the city. But if I want to go five miles closer to the city, that's right. It, I can't afford the same thing, or right, depending on the metropolitan area, I suppose, um, where those hot pockets are. But sometimes you can check all the boxes. Sometimes, yeah. If you're willing to change the location. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I've told people in the past, and people especially new to the area, I said, why don't you do this here? Based on our conversation, here are the three areas I think you could be interested in. Not by county, but by general area neighborhoods. Why don't you go and have lunch in one, have coffee in another, go to rest, go to dinner at a restaurant in another. You know, see what it looks like because you've got to live there and you got to feel that. Don't just look at the house because you could look at the house and maybe it does check all ten boxes. Yeah, but when you get there, you're walking around the area like, and you're like, this doesn't feel right for me. Yeah, test your user experience. Test your customer experience. Try it. Yeah, yeah. Like get get a taste test before you actually decide to buy in, in a community. That's right. Yeah, right. that's right. That's great. and talk to great people. Advice. It's a great place to do it. Yeah. It's in a coffee shop or a restaurant. Say, hey, we're not from around here, but we'd like to. We'd like your impact you know, input rather. And going back to the the inventory problem, if if we want to call it that, there is another dynamic that it, it didn't really matter to me what what the market was, whether it was hot buyer's market or seller's market, right. um, either way, you know, I, I always found this to be true was if there were 20 houses, let's say uh, available between 500,000 and 700,000 in a certain location. And there were 20 buyers looking in that price range mm -hmm. in that location. So 20 buyers, 20 houses. Right. It never works out where, hey, this house is for that person. This house is for that person. This house is for that person. What I tend to see was, okay, of these 20 houses, the top three to five, all 20 people want those the, yeah. those three to five houses. Like, <laughs> those ones represent, the, those are the best ones in the price range. Right. And then the, the, the quote unquote worst three to five in the price range, were always lagging on the market yeah. until they got freshened up or they came down to a price point where they were now the best in the marketplace. Um, but, it, you know, what we were experiencing a year or two ago was this, there were 10 houses and there were a hundred buyers in any particular price range. And yet everybody only wanted the, the same three out yeah. of the 10. So, you know, it, it, it you know, trying to understand that balance. I guess I've never been part of a market in the DMV area where you've had uh, 10 buyers in 100 houses. That would be a different problem. Yeah. We haven't quite <laughs> experienced yeah. that, fortunately, although there are markets that do experience that. Yeah, we're not in that. I mean, I, I have to tell you, I have a colleague who had an open house and it was on Sunday and he had 20 offers by Tuesday night hmm. and because that, that's when he closed the office, yeah. uh, offer period. 20. I, I mean, that it's been a year since I've seen something like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, the house was nice. It was a nice piece of property, right? It, it was all good. And obviously, checked a lot of those boxes that we were talking about for at least 20 people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's a lot of people. Yeah. And at least, at least people, everybody except for the one that gets the house leaves a little bit disappointed from that scenario. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, again, re enter the emotional intelligence conversation. It's, you know, in real estate now, you went from, you know, navigating the political landscape and how that game works to navigating people feeling disappointed because they weren't the one that ended up with the house or or their elation that you were able to help them compete strategically um, in order for them to get the house if you represent the buyer yeah. or if you're representing the seller to be able to 
to position the house to get more than they expected and et cetera, right? So, yeah. so talk about some of these skills that you have found really good for you to to offer your clients. You know, mm-hmm. you know, what are your skills that you offer your clients that you're like, wow, like this is one of my superpowers. This translated has translated really well throughout my career. You know, I want to learn a little bit more about your uh, your meatball recipe superpower later. Yeah, but yeah. but let's talk about your your real estate superpower to your clients, like. You know, what are those things that your clients are better off working with you for? Yeah, it's listening more than anything else. And I and I didn't do it well early in my career when I was on Capitol Hill, right? Because one of the things you want to do is, I wasn't a member of Congress, but you certainly want to advocate for whatever. And people that get into politics naturally are passionate about, the, about it. I mean, you don't get into it because you're not. It just you're passionate about it, right? Especially at a young age, you care about certain things and you really want to push an agenda forward, even if it doesn't comport necessarily 100% with the person you're working for, but you care about it. And so as a result, you talk a lot. Um, and it's good and bad. That cuts both ways. Um, but I learned that one of the things when you were talking to constituents is that they wanted to be heard. A lot of them wanted to have things fixed and repaired. You know, I represent my, my first boss represented an area located near Newark airport. And there were people that would call one person would call in particular and put the phone out the window so I could hear the planes landing at Newark airport as if I didn't believe her. Well, I knew that planes were landing. (laughs) There wasn't an easy fix to it, right? The New York Tricon area, as it's called, is the busiest, um, airport hub in the country, not as an airport, but with all the airports, Newark, Kennedy, uh, LaGuardia. Guardia, yeah. It's pretty busy, not to mention some of the private ones like Teterboro. Mm-hmm. The, well, the planes kept shut their engines off in Chicago and glided. <laughs> so there's going to be there's going to be airport noise. Right. But what I came to realize with most of the people that were complaining, and they had a legitimate complaint. I, be, I was out there, and it is noisy. And they're coming pretty close to your house is that they wanted to be heard. They mm-hmm. wanted you to listen. They wanted to feel like, hey, you care enough to spend a few minutes of your time listening to me about something that's driving me crazy 24 yeah. seven. And I tried to and I tried to teach that to some of the younger people in our office, like because, you know, some of these people would call and I felt bad for a lot of the interns or the younger people who would come in and they just some people weren't as nice as they could be. And it was just fr- because they're frustrated. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we did. I mean, we, it took a long time. I mean, that's one of the things people don't understand about the government that frustrates people about the government is that it takes time. But it was set up that way to take time. You know, it's I, I've described it this way. It's not a speedboat. It's more like a carrier. So to turn it takes a long, long time. But we were working on for repairing that and, and dealing with the issues, right? And the air noise issue was a perennial issue. It probably still is today because Newark Airport's still open. Um, so listening to your clients, I think, is the most important thing. Hmm. Listening and then helping them sort of form their opinion a little bit. And what, what I mean by that is not changing their mind when they say, well, geez, we want to be in a townhouse, not an apartment. But just at least explain to them the market and give them the benefits of both. You know? So this is, I, I really like this. You recognize people want to be heard. Yes. And one of the skills you've developed is listening to that. Yeah. And in many cases, validating that. Yeah. What do you want to be heard for? Me? Yeah. <laughs> is it, yeah I'm listening to you right now. I want, I want, I want to hear you. <laughs> That's interesting. What do you um, want to be heard Geez, for? I've never been asked that by, by anybody. <laughs> maybe nobody cares what I want to say. Maybe that's the problem, Tommy. You're the only person that does. Maybe what do I want to be heard for? You know, I, I think that we all want, I mean, I, I can't speak. I don't think I can speak specifically to that. Um, but I love talking about music and sports and it probably drives my family crazy because I talk about people and athletes and singers from the past and they're they're not interested in hearing about that. You know, my, <laughs> my son will say, oh, here we go. We're going to hear about that talking about some guy who played when the television screen was black and white or something <laughs> like that. So, but I like talking about that stuff. So you have an affinity for past social coach culture. I do. Yeah. You're still a young guy. 
You definitely have more hair than I do. <laughs> My wife says I was born 20 years too late, though. Uh, okay. So maybe I was. I don't know. Maybe I was. I don't know. I don't know that I was. Um, but I do love Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> I do love Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. And I hope that at 73, I'll be able to do half the things he's able to do. That would be amazing. Cool. That, yeah. would, that would be amazing. That, I don't yeah. know how he does it. But. So you, you don't just want to be heard. You want to be seen doing those things. <laughs> yeah, that would be something. If you see me up on stage doing that now, uh, that would be impressive. That would be impressive. Yeah. Wow. Um, so tell me a little bit about that other superpower that you were telling me, hey, you got to get my meatball recipe. This is something I do great. Well, I didn't say I was going to give that to you. Oh, darn. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I was trying. I didn't say I was going to give that to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make them for you, but I won't give them to you. Can't give that to you. So at home, you know, now we do more work from home. We're doing more cooking from home. You know, you would think um, we do some. We do some. Um, you know, our my kids are busy with that activities and their friends. So they're always out a lot and coming mm -hmm. and going a lot. Um, we prioritize having dinner at home together. We try because my son's going off to college next year. My daughter's starting high school. We realize that we're not going to be able to do this as regularly. So we try to get them to sit down and actually focus on a meal with us. And sometimes that'll be going out for a quick bite to eat, even if it's not at home. Um, so. so what's that one thing that when you, when you are cooking, the kids are like, oh yeah. I want to be home. Dad's it's me making it's the, meatballs. It's the meatballs. Yeah, it's meatballs. Yeah, my daughter, nice. my son. Yeah, they really they really like it. And what kind of meatballs? Are you yeah, like you mix the meat? Like you got turkey. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you. Uh, I'm not gonna tell I'm you. Trying. I'm trying. I will I will make them for you, <laughs> but I'm not gonna no, we don't use turkey. Uh, we, don't, we don't use turkey. I will tell you we don't use turkey. How about that? There you go. Okay, fair I'll enough. Tell you we don't use that. Uh, uh, I'm listening enough to know not to pry further on the, on the <laughs> recipe. <laughs> No, because then they're not then they're not special anymore. If I wouldn't go out and make them, that's right. You got you got to brand that thing. It yeah. actually makes it, it's actually Trademark. a meal that everybody enjoys in my house. My wife, my kids they they all they all love it. So it's it's kind of nice. It's kind of a nice thing. Yeah. So tell me, is there any you know other special human trick or or just a story of something you're like wow you know we talk we we invest a lot of our time thinking about yeah. smarter ways to do real estate, real estate with intelligence. You know, listening to others, yeah. helping the others prioritize their list. But, but give, give us a human story. Tell us something. Oh man, like when I started in this career, I, I did something dumb, or when I did this, it was it was not the opposite of real estate with intelligence. Yeah, you know, so there's a couple things, and, and I think it comes from my time working in politics. Like, um, so you know, I was saying that I worked on Capitol Hill, and I represented or I worked for the representative who had the world's largest landfill in the i mean it was it was ridiculous Twenty six thousand tons of municipal solid waste every day and i came to learn more about garbage than any human should <laughs> and it, my colleagues we had colleagues that worked with us in the mayor's office the governor's <laughs> office and other people and we all would joke about the useless knowledge we have about garbage i mean it was it, it was ridiculous right but it was very it was a critical it was a critical issue because our district you know was taking all of new york solid waste all of the you know eight and a half million people was going to one place and so we desperately well, the people desperately wanted that to change um and that's when i not only listened but we acted on that was a big deal that because we, we knew how it was just i mean it was it was terrible. It was a it was a poorly thought out plan for the city of New York. And what was the result? It closed in two thousand one. It closed the, the landfill closed in two thousand one. It closed in two thousand one. Sadly, reopened for a short period as a transfer station after nine eleven. Mm. They were taking uh, a lot of the debris from from the trade towers. And what is it and today? It's going to be a park. A huge park. They're going to make it into a huge park. It's going to be. I think. I believe is going to be larger than Central Park. Wow. Um, so it's it's going to it's going to be big. So it's closed. It's been closed, I guess, now for over 20 years. Um, so I, I call it dealing with an, an unreal estate issue. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a real estate issue, but it's unreal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I well, all the time I was working, I never thought it was I wasn't I wouldn't have believed it would have closed, but it did. But it did. So it's kind of a win. So how about if you were to relate yourself or is there to a movie character or a TV show character? Is there? Is there is there any character out there that you're like, oh yeah, like, you know, I, I can kind of see myself. I relate with that character. Um, yeah, I think based on my overall build and construction, it would have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> 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 I 
um, I think it would have to be Ray Romano, right? And that seems kind of easy for, you know, we share a similar ethnicity. He's from Queens. I'm from Brooklyn. We're both Mets fans. Um, you know, and if you saw my family, my extended family combined with my wife's extended family, you'd understand the interesting fin- family dynamics that he had to deal with. I had to deal with some of them. I always thought it was like, if we our families got together, it would be kind of a great sitcom because yeah. you can't make it up. He wrote that sitcom based on your family. I think he did. <laughs> I think I think he did. I feel like I should get some royalties yeah. from uh, Ray Romano there. But I think it's very similar. I think there's a lot of similarities between us that way. But cool. Um, while we're talking about work from home yeah. and office a little bit, yeah. You know, I usually ask everybody, how do you define home? Especially since it's becoming more and more of an emphasis. How do you define home for you and your family? What do you mean exactly? Well, what does home, how do you define it? What do, what do you, what does it mean to you? You know, so it's interesting. Um, Even the word. Yeah. I mean, you know, so it's interesting because we, um, you know, I always like to say, I think we have a house that was too big for us and the pandemic hit. And I rethought that. <laughs> I said, oh, this is about the right size. Because <laughs> as you can imagine, we were spending a lot of time together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my, my kids were a lot younger. And so, you know, they want to be out. They want to be doing things. They want their own space. So, um, and we were very fortunate, by the way, because we had just renovated our kitchen months prior um, to the pandemic, and maybe six months prior to the pandemic hitting. But we were very fortunate. So we had a big open space and we were very, we were very, very lucky that way. And a lot of people didn't have the benefits that we had during the pandemic. I mean, they were in some confined environments and we were lucky. And so, um, but home to me is where my family is. I mean, they're the four of us. Um, I mean, they're, to the center of my life, to the most important part of my life. Um, and, you know, there are challenges with having teenagers. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's the best times that I've spent has been with my family. Breaking news. We have challenges with teenagers. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope anybody listening today isn't like, boy, that Eugene, he really is insightful. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I really, you know, have, have enjoyed spending time. I mean, I'm disappointed my son's moving away to go go to college i mean it's a great growth experience for him but at the same time we've had so much fun together um and as a family you know we've had a lot of fun together as a family so i've been i've been fortunate that way so home is where the family is yeah pretty much i mean we're we're, wherever we end up i mean wherever we end up i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't care i mean i love our house we've made it our home but it's really me it's based on the people i think that's true for anybody i mean it, it seems a little bit trite Right. It probably does for a lot of people, but I think it's, it, it's ultimately the right, you know, That's the not right place. At all. I mean, this is um, fascinating how many people I've asked this question and how different the answers actually are. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there there is some level of, of centering or grounded. That's right. Um, you know, I've heard people say it's where home is where we, I come from. Home is where the heart is. Home yeah. is where my family is. Uh, but uh, a home is what uh, I, I want it to be once I meet my vision for what the home is. It's it, but it's not there yet. I, I hear all kinds of different versions of of definitions of home, and yet nobody knows really how to define office space except for the technical version. People yeah. have lots of different That's versions of how to define home, and when we start talking about okay, well, work from home now has a, a new almost infringement on our, our former definition of home because <clears throat> now you brought work to your family place, right? Yeah. And yet how you people are, are redefining what the office means to them is is part of this, this change in uh, the paradigm of society for work from home versus remote work versus going into the office and the workplace and and. I don't think that's very clearly defined. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting dynamic. I mean, a quick anecdote, you know, my my father-in-law, mother-in-law, like me, they were New Yorkers, they lived in Queens. And um, my father-in-law was on the subway in New York in the early 1960s. He was a lawyer um, with everybody else. (laughs) And he was wearing a suit. And it was before there were air conditioned cars and it was a 90 degree day. And he came home and said to my mother-in-law, I've had enough. I'm done. We are leaving. I'm not doing this. I'm not going to spend the next 40 or so years doing this every day. This is insane. <laughs> this is crazy. And he wasn't wrong, right? It turns out he was right. So they moved two hours away to a place they'd never been in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Um, they loved it. Um, they 
you know, they that that's where my wife says she's from, and she is. She was born there, and but they loved living there. It was a quiet suburb in Connecticut, and I they never looked back. Never look back. I mean, they were in New York was our heart for, you know, they rooted for the Yankees and so on. But beyond that, they never look back. And I think for, for him, he put a premium on his lifestyle that he didn't want to live that way every day, hmm. going back and forth to work, that he could drive to work and be there in 20 minutes and be happy. Ahead of his time. I, I think so. I think in a lot of ways, he like, he knew exactly what he wanted. I mean, he kind of knew what he wanted to do, but more importantly, he knew the way he wanted to live his life. And that's kind of the key to all this more than anything else, right? I mean, it really is. Yeah. Right? Getting, How do you want to live your life? And getting clarity on that allows you to be more clear in the decisions you make of where home is. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. You know, some people don't, look, some people love living in the city. They want the grittiness and the of the city and they think it's interesting. And, you know, I've had people say to me, well, we don't want a home that's brand new. We don't have to do anything to. We like a home that has tilted floors <laughs> and th- this character. character. Yeah, they call it character. I call it tilted floors, right? <laughs> um, whereas I can tell you, my wife and I, when we were looking at houses, we told our agent at the time, this was 2007, we don't want anything like that. We want to go in, want to paint, we're willing to paint, but we don't want to do much of that. <laughs> and that's fine, right? Everybody likes something different. Do you have a new appreciation for the past realtors in your life now that you are one? Yes, I think I do. <laughs> I think I do. Yeah, I'm on, the other, I'm on the other end of the equation. Yeah, I do. I mean, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with some really good clients too. I mean, I've, and, you know, it's been an interesting phase of their life. You know, people that are semi-retired, downsizing, but looking to live in the area because it's easy to get to a major metropolitan area with museums, sports, restaurants, and that sort of stuff. So, um, and then people who are kind of newish to the area and are at the beginning of considering starting a family. Mm-hmm. Um, and the dichotomy is kind of interesting, right? Because they're looking for very different things. Mm. You know, one cares about schools. One doesn't really care about schools. Um, you know, one cares about the size of the house. One cares about, you know, where the bathrooms, you know, if there's a bathroom on the main floor or not. Another person wants to live in a condo because they don't want to have to deal with the house. So um, it's human interaction, Tommy. It's where we started this conversation, I think. I mean, it is it is ultimately about human interaction more than it is about anything. I mean, that's, that's really about the place you mm. live. I mean, you know, my grandparents lived in a house that you know, for over almost 60 years and they accommodated, you know, it was geez, 1500 square feet and the house accommodated 25 people for holidays. So that, that human interaction, yeah, you said you, you, you could relate earlier with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes, <laughs> yes. But yes. You, you, you don't- I know think, you're surprised. You, you, you don't think uh, realtors get, are going to turn into Terminators anytime soon. I don't think so. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. Boy, that'd be, that, that would be a bad, but that would be a bad vibe to open. Don't you think, Tommy? No, I think- I think. What about the, politicians? <laughs> Maybe that's for a different podcast. Maybe that's for a different podcast. No, no I no, I think I think ultimately this takes us full circle back to where we started talking. And what we were talking about was emotional intelligence and the ability to connect with people because that's who people want to work with. Where do they feel at home? Where do they feel comfortable? Maybe it's the cheers model more than anything else. <laughs> no, really, maybe it is. I mean, right? Because it's it's the same characters going in there. They felt comfortable year after year after year. We got into it. We became part of their lives, focused on what was going on there. There was really no big drama going on with that. Where everybody but feels. Where everybody knows your name. Everybody knows your name. But they right. felt comfortable there, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So we were interested in their lives, not because of the drama, but because of the stories. Mm-hmm. But because we came to like them. We came to laugh at them. Right. We came to know their flaws, their strengths, their weaknesses. There was no perfect character on that show. Hmm. Just as there just as life. I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect character in life, right? But that's okay. That's okay. You just have to be willing as a root as a person who's looking at a real estate agent, are you willing to trust them? Do you hmm. think they will do the best job for you? And that's what it comes down to more than anything else. I mean, hmm. and, and I think that's true in most service professions. And what I say, what I mean by that is, you know, I've worked as a lobbyist, I've worked in public relations. Really, we all can do the same stuff to some degree. Mm -hmm. But who do you think you trust and will answer your calls no matter what and will work tirelessly for you? I mean, Mm -hmm. that that's really what it is more than anything else. Interesting. Yeah. We want someone to 
to advocate for us that, and we could trust that they will. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's, I think that's exactly what it was. I mean, look, I've had, I've had the opportunity to lobby and advocate for major corporations, nonprofits, um, of all kinds, um, come across some interesting people. But at the end of the day, the people that hired us were the people that trusted us to do the job. Hmm. That's what it came down to more than anything else. Well, this was fascinating discussion today, Eugene. I really enjoy getting your perspective uh, and understanding that uh, Ray Romano now owes you some royalties. He probably does. <laughs> he probably does. I think he gets like two hundred thousand dollars for a show in Vegas. So, <laughs> and you know, thank you for your definition of home and also the unique perspective you've brought throughout your careers and your travels, uh, especially on the work from home concept. Sure. Not just in this discussion, but in um, all the content you've been sharing and we've been discussing as well. My pleasure, Tommy. Thank you for having me. This podcast is about real estate with intelligence. It is pulling the sword from the stone. This podcast is about that unique balance in real estate, that balance between technological intelligence and our emotional intelligence and the transactions and interactions with one another in the real estate process. That's why we're inviting expert guests, people who are knowledgeable and bring different perspective. Join me in exploring this fascination, the look behind the scenes of technological advancement and how it's interacting with people's decisions in real estate.